spray. Like this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I, and I just wanted to introduce the zebrafish to you, uh, and what we're, how we're using the zebrafish for our drug discovery program in Leuven. Um, and also mainly why we're doing it. So what I'll do in the first part uh, is to introduce the zebrafish, uh, what all the different uh, indication areas that the zebrafish is good for uh, in terms of what, what medical areas we can address, uh, and, but then tell you a little bit more about what we're doing in, uh, in the area of natural product discovery to, f to find novel bioactive natural products. And then I'll end with some uh, toxicity apps that we use, which are useful in the discovery process. And then Camilla will, will tell you more about what we're doing uh, in epilepsy, so genetic models and also product discovery, so just splitting up in, in two talks. Um, so the main, reason, the main reason why we do things is that uh, this is, uh, the, here is the, are the chances of, of, a new, of a new molecule entering clinical trials, the chances of it actually getting all the way through clinical trials, if this is the success rate. So currently only one out of every 10 or even less uh, in, uh, investigational new drugs succeeds in, in the clinical trials. And the goal is to um, shorten this process but also, also increase the success rate of, of drugs. And um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry has been struggling, of course, for many years to, to make this happen. And many new technologies have come on board. Um, and what people are now starting to realize is that uh, uh, we will need uh, not only better chemistry, so uh, using more drug-like structurally diverse compounds, uh, but also better biology. And uh, so the, the more the increase used of more in vivo models, so earlier in the drug discovery process. So not just, for, not, not just to find uh, the bioactivity of your compound, but also to look at the city. And so uh, our lab is focusing on both of these. So we're collaborating with the Center for Drug Design and Discovery at the university, which is uh, making a very nice library of uh, drug-like structurally diverse compounds. And we have a strong focus on natural products, uh, not just from plants, but also from microbes. And I'll tell you a little bit more about a, a project that we're doing there. And of course, uh, zebrafish, I'll introduce to you now. Uh, what we have at the university is something that we call the Chemical Genetics Initiative. So that centers around our laboratory, which has now been renamed from pharmaceutical biology into a molecular biodiscovery. Um, and there we have our zebrafish platform, the natural product isolation, and our epilepsy program. And we collaborate with the Center for Drug Design and Discovery. Those are the folks who have the, the, the library. But they, they can also you know, chemistry for um, hit to lead programs. So once we find a, a bioactive compound, um, they have all the medicinal chemistry in place to be able to take it all the way and make a very optimized lead that is ready to go into late stage preclinical development. Um, and uh, so we're also working with external partners, uh, the Strathclyde Institute in Scotland for access to libraries, but also uh, biotech companies and pharma companies. Um, so uh, coming to the fish. So I don't know if some of you have seen fish in a, in a pet store before. Uh, there's a very common aquarium fish if you want to start off uh, having an aquarium at home. Uh, choose zebrafish because they're very hard to kill. Uh, if you try hard enough, you, you can. But they're very, they're very easy to take care of, to, for example, guppies. And a lot of people ask us, well, why don't you work with guppies? Uh, I, I don't know what you call them in Italian. You know guppies? Uh, they, they have these long, they're very bright and colorful, and they have these long fins. But they get diseases all the time, and they die very easily. Uh, and they also give birth to live young, kind of like sharks. Uh, and the advantage with zebrafish is that they lay lots of eggs and that you can see the embryos developing in, in these uh, chorions. Uh, and so this is the embryonic development. It's very rapid. Uh, so this is, a, this is already 24 hours after fertilization of the egg. Um, just in general, I won't go into too much detail, there's very high genetic, physiologic, and pharmacological to hum mammals and humans. Uh, high fecundity, so it means large numbers of offspring and a very small size of those offspring. So they can f uh, these are only a few millimeters long, so they can fit into 96 well plates. Uh, and uh, yeah, here are 24 This is two days. Uh, and we only need, importantly, we only need microgram amounts of compounds, and that's important when we're both for natural product discovery and for medicinal chemistry. So when chemists 
either when you isolate a molecule or when you synthesize a new molecule, sometimes you only have very small amounts, only a few milligrams. And that's not enough to do uh, a lot of tests on mice. And um, so on the other hand, there, it's enough to do quite a few tests on zebrafish then. And uh, the compounds are normally readily absorbed through the GI tract, through, through the gills, so you just need to add them to the water. Uh, so you have your little fish swimming in a 96 well plate, you add your compound, and in most cases you can whether you're looking for a bioactivity or a potential uh, toxicity. So the, just to give you an idea of the size, these are five-day-old larvae, and this is a normal paper clip. Uh, we, 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 we do a lot of effort to get them to swim in formation like that, but I won't tell, I'll tell you later. Uh, so uh, mostly you can, you can um, just add the compounds to the water, but you can also micro-inject things into the egg. So if, you, if we're delivering DNA expression vectors, RNA, proteins, peptides, antisense molecules, those are larger molecules and they're not readily absorbed, so we have to micro-inject them into, into the, the newly fertilized egg, or we can also micro-inject them, and it's a little bit more work, into the circulation uh, of an of a older larvae. Uh, but we're, we have a technician who's reasonably good at that now as well. Just to give you an idea of, the, um, of a, few, a few of the different assays, so uh, here you have something called a whole mount in situ hybridization, so you can look at the expression of a particular gene. This is a, a and it's, uh, but it, using the intact larvae that's been fixed, so you can see the expression pattern of your gene. You can make uh, transgenic lines. Uh, this is GFP being expressed only in the, in the vasculature, and that's relevant, of course, for our angiogenesis assays. Here we're looking at bone formation, uh, cartilage formation, and here uh, inflammation. So the, the black dots here at the tip of the tail, which, been, which has been cut off, represent uh, leukocytes, so white blood cells that are migrating to the site of injury. And uh, this is a small list, which is uh, just a short overview and um, uh, has been growing over the years. There are basically every indication area from cancer to blood disorders, cardiovascular disorders, CNS disorders, immunity, metabolic disorders, and a few other things uh, can be covered in the fish. Essentially, you have a microscopic vertebrate in your 96 well plate that you can normally uh, look at almost every indication. The only things that the fish uh, do not have is the placenta, because of course they're not mammals, uh, and lungs. So asthma is maybe not the best area to look at for, for fish. But even there, maybe something can be done. Uh, so this is another example of a, of a, tra of a transgenic line uh, with uh, ds red expressed under control of the insulin promoter in the, so looking at the pancreatic beta cells. Uh, this is the, um, the bone formation assay again, so uh, doing an alizarin red stain at 10 days post-fertilization, uh, treating with uh, a, glucocorticoid, uh, a glucocorticoid, in this case prednisolone, which is, induces bone loss, and then rescuing it with a bisphosphonate, in this case uh, alandronate. Um, uh, so this, this is not something we normally do in the lab, but it is an assay that, that, we, that we have. Um, this is actually something that I was involved in earlier in my career, uh, a large-scale genetic screen looking at um, the projection of the retinotectal, uh, sorry, of the, of the retinal ganglion neurons in, into the first visual station of the, of the, of the visual system, uh, which in, in the fish is the optic tectum. It's a very stereotypic projection so that uh, neurons from the front of the eye project to the back of the tectum from the back of the eye to the front of the tectum, from the left eye to the right tectum, and everything is upside down and backwards, but it's very stereotypical. And we, were, we did a large genetic screen to look for mutants that had problems with this projection. These are two normal projections. And we found a few mutants, a very small handful, uh, that had a disturbed retinotectal projection. Uh, th so this was just with the ejection of dyes into the fixed uh, retina, and the dyes were then project, uh, transported to the to the wherever the axons were going, and we found a few mutants that had a, a disturbed projections, and those turned out to be very interesting genes, which were very important for axon guidance, um, and they've been published over the years. Uh, another possibility is to look at the um, optokinetic motor response. So if you if you're sitting in the train and you're looking at the person across from you, and they're looking out the window, and normally their eyes are doing movements like this as they're following as they're following the surroundings, unless they're on drugs, and then they're just staring straight ahead, uh, and, or they're very sleepy. Um, and, but in normal case, the eyes are doing these so-called saccadic eye movements, and, uh, 
And that involves, you know, obviously vision, but also motor, motor coordination. And that's the optokinetic uh, response. And fish have that as well. And if you saw the picture of the larvae, you can see these large eyes on the fish. And if you have, if you have your fish fixed here in the middle, uh, so that it can't move, only the eyes move. So if you have a rotating chamber here uh, of uh, alternating black and white stripes, then the eyes will follow the stripes. You know, they'll follow one and then, until they can't go anymore, and then they'll snap back to the next one and then they'll have this movement. And you can monitor that with uh, video tracking. And basically, uh, Stefan Neuhaus in Switzerland, uh, he also did a screen looking for mutants um, and found a few mutants that had problems doing it properly. The eyes would not move at all or, um, uh, or they would move in the wrong direction. And they, these were also very interesting genes that are involved in both uh, vision and the, and the coordination of, of the eye movement. Another area uh, <clears throat> is with the hair cells. So you know that in, the, in order to hear in the inside of your ear, you have these tiny little hair cells. Uh, and a major cause of deafness is the loss of those hair cells. Um, and in the, the fish inner ear also has hair cells. And the fish also have the same hair cells along the, long, the lateral line of their body in order to detect uh, uh, water movements. And so uh, genetic mutants have been found that, uh, that have a, loss, a progressive loss of hair cells. This can also be induced by drugs, so it's a, it's a pro, uh, that is known as ototoxicity. So that's something that you do not want your drug to have as a side effect. If your if your drug is causing the loss of hair cells, that's definitely not something you want to have. So that's something we can screen for in the fish. Um, this is another area. Uh, so instead of looking at the at the uh, at the appearance or the structure of the fish, you can look at the function of something. Uh, so the, these are these are. Uh, um, this is a group in, uh, in, the, in the U.S. that developed phos uh, fluorescently quenched lipids. So, so basically, uh, when the lipids were when, when the lipids were intact, uh, there was no fluorescence. But when they're digested by the digestive system, um, then they're cleaved, and then the fluorescence is liberated. So, in a normal fish uh, that is eating food that has these lipids, you would see the fluorescence throughout the, the uh, digestive tract. And uh, basically, they were looking for mutants that, uh, genetic mutants that looked normal that, and that had, that had a normal looking digestive tract, that, but that were unable to digest these, these, uh, these fluorescent lipids. And, and they found a few. So, and this is one called fat free. And so that's to help uh, look at genes in, in digestive physiology. Uh, and uh, sorry, that slide that shouldn't be in there. Yeah, so what we're interested in is uh, screening. So I won't go through all the genetic screens that are possible and the, and the transgenic methods. I'll just focus in the interest of time on small molecule screening because that's what we're interested in. And the first people to really look at zebrafish uh, with the idea of finding bioactive small molecules was way back in 1957. Um, some uh, people at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, which doesn't even exist anymore, um, and they published this paper, you know, fish embryos is a bioassay in testing chemicals for effects on cell division and differentiation. A very nice paper. And for the next 50 years, no one bothered to follow this up. There's nothing in the literature. Until some f folks at Harvard, um, uh, independently, because they obviously didn't read this paper because they didn't cite it, um, they published a paper on, 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 on so something very similar. And that was about 10 years ago. And since then, a lot of groups have started to work on it. And the basic idea, is simply to take, as I mentioned, uh, embryos and larvae, combine them with small molecules, which you can't really see there, in 96 well plates, and to look at effects on developing embryos and larvae, depending on what you're interested in. Are you finding, you know, uh, uh, basically anything that's affecting uh, a developmental or, or a physiological process, um, whatever you can normally do a genetic screen in. And one of our areas is, of course, and I'm preaching to the choir here, perhaps. <laughs> I don't need to convince you of natural products, but um, we're very interested in natural products, mainly for the reason that they, uh, we believe, uh, as do others, uh, that they have evolved over you know, literally hundreds of millions of years to interact with specific protein motifs. And there's a limited number of protein motifs. So even, even though the, the biological target of a particular small molecule that's growing in a bacteria or in a sponge may be a bacterial or a fungal um, protein that has no equivalent in humans, the protein, uh, the structural motifs with which these small molecules are interacting are going to find counterparts in human proteins, right? And so the likelihood that your small molecule 
that is existing in a sponge or in a fungus or in a bacterium or in a plant that it'll find it a, 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 a protein target to interact with in an in a, in a intelligent way in humans is relatively high. Um, and uh, so the, the, the number of molecules you can find with a, with a good bioactivity is, 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 uh, is reasonably high with natural products. And, we're, and all our zebra screens have really um, uh, shown that. Time I noticed that there's a tribe here called Hehe <laughs> in Tanzania. In any case, one of the um, one of the ways we started was to uh, was a collaboration with the Muhimbili University uh, in Dar es Salaam. A former PhD student lab went back there and became a professor, and now has his own lab. Actually, now has his own institute, um, and he. He has been collaborating with uh, traditional healers across Tanzania to see what kind of medicinal plants are used there uh, and has been uh, uh, for all kinds of areas, both for epilepsy and, all, and, and any other medical in indication. And so we started off uh, uh, collaborating with him. And one of the areas that we focused on was angiogenesis. And perhaps I don't need to say too much about angiogenesis since you also work on that area. But uh, very briefly, of course, it's a, um, I just want to mention, reiterate that it's a very complex process, not so easy to look at in vitro, um, because there are so many different aspects going on. You can look at one aspect at, at a time normally, because uh, you have the production of angiogenic factors, the activation of, uh, of endothelial cells, the proliferation, their migration, tube formation, loop formation, and the stabilization. So these are all a lot of different processes happening, um, one after the other and, and together. And so, yeah, you can look at, uh, you know, vas um, uh, tube formation in vitro. You can look at proliferation. Um, in vitro assays are very quick, uh, but they're not that predictive of what's going to happen in vivo. Uh, so you see an activity here. It won't necessarily translate into a nice activity in, in vivo. In vivo, in, in mice, obviously, is still the gold standard. And you can look at size of tumor growth and uh, the, the, the degree of blood vessel formation in, within, a, within a, a tumor volume. Um, and, but this, is, of course, is a relatively slow and laborious and expensive process. You cannot screen large numbers of molecules. Um, and you also need a reasonably a large amount of compound to do that. And that's where zebrafish come into play. So we first started out uh, looking at angiogenesis in fish using a whole mountain C2 hybridization. So this is uh, looking at the expression of, a, uh, of the VGF receptor. Um, uh, which is expressed spe specifically in the blood vessels. And you see these little spikes coming up here. These are intersegmental blood vessels, uh, which form by the process of angiogenesis. The longer blood vessels, you'll see it better in the transgenic line later, the longer blood vessels are formed by vasculogenesis. So we're interested in these intersegmental blood vessels. And so if you take an antisense oligo and you knock down VEGF, um, then you see a loss of those intersegmental blood vessels. And this is a movie uh, just showing you It'll slow down after a while, but you'll see the uh, the blood flow within the uh, within the blood vessels. So uh, yeah, so this is the blood flowing from the heart to the tail, to the through the dorsal aorta, and back to the posterior cardinal vein. And then um, and then you have the intersegmental vessels uh, where the blood is flowing up and down. So if you see a lack of blood flow in these intersegmental vessels, then that's an indication that there's a potential loss of angiogenesis. Uh, but what's more informative than that is uh, to actually look at uh, transcending line, which is hard to see here. Uh, uh, but yet, uh, you have a bunch of uh, intersegmental vessels uh, going up there, uh, which you can see a little bit better here. So this is the wild situation. You can see these intersegmental vessels. And when, um, see, it's, it's not just the complete loss of outgrowth. Uh, but it's also the morphology that you can see, and, and this is actually a small molecule drug which is causing the lack of luminization. So the blood vessels are growing up, but they're not forming hollow tubes. So there's no blood, there's no blood flowing through these uh, vessels here, and the fish become very edemic. And uh, so that's something very nicely that we can see. And uh, so we, we took this assay and we started working with some of these Tanzanian plants. Uh, these, these are all medicinal plants which are used for different purposes. Um, this is actually, uh, oxygonum is actually used by um, traditional healers in Kenya to treat women with excessive menstrual blood flow. And possibly, possibly, that could have something to do with in inhibiting angiogenesis. Um, in any case, and plectranthus is used for everything, uh, including for uh, preventing your husband running away and sleeping with other women. Uh, but I'm not, we, we don't want to contemplate a clinical trial for that. 
Um, but, it, it, but it is used for actually a number of legitimate purposes, and it is a very a popular medicinal plant. In, um, it's also known as uh, Coleus forscoli, and it's the, uh, it's the source of forscolin, which is a very widely used uh, small molecule. And so um, uh, it's hard to see here again, but uh, trust me, there are intersegmental vessels here in the wild type fish, and there are absolutely none here treated with the extract, and, and the same here for uh, Plectranthus barbatus. Here you can see the vessels, and, and here there are none. Um, and so just starting off with, with very basic um, uh, separation methods, so the thin layer chromatography, we got lucky uh, two times in a row uh, and were able to isolate uh, individual bands which corresponded to, were clean enough to get, to get uh, pure molecules which um, gave us a, a clear mass spec signal. Um, uh, and then in the, uh, for basically isolated directly from the thin layer chromatography plate, we're able to give us a dose dependent uh, both for the um, extract and then for the pure molecule, which turned out to be emidin for, um, for oxygonum. Uh, both the extract and the, and the pure molecule <coughs> give a nice anti-angiogenic effect. And the same thing for uh, Plectranthus barbatus. There's a small molecule here that turned out to be a previously uncharacterized but, but structurally known molecule, choline A lactone, um, which then uh, corresponded very nicely to, to the activity of, of the crude extract. So the, this was the TLC mediated, you know, bioassay guided fractionation using a zebrafish assay of, of a small molecule. And we, um, we then uh, looked at the activity of the pure molecules uh, in vitro, so looking at uh, endothelial cell migration and tube formation and we're able to see uh, nice effects of the, of, the, uh, of the molecules. And we published this, and you probably have seen the paper if, uh, if you've been looking into it, then uh, in plus one last year, finally. Uh, and what, uh, what's, uh, we've been, obviously you, you can't always get lucky with TLC, and so we've been, uh, we've been collaborating with Jean-Luc Wolfender, uh, who you may know in Geneva, who's kind of at the cutting edge of these of these microfractionation and um, uh, hyphenated NMR techniques uh, to basically combine the zebrafish assays with the most advanced um, uh, natural product and analytical methods. And so basically there you start off with the screening of, of extracts, go to um, uh, UHPLC TOF ms um, uh, which is a true, a true microfractionation to, to, to basically optimize the, the separation of your extract and then with the geometri uh, geometrical method transfer to basically develop uh, the optimal semi-prep HPLC MS. Uh, there, you, there you get your fractions, um, which then, uh, which, where we take 10% 10, 10 of the fraction, uh, and there we sometimes only have a, a single microgram or even less in a fraction, and that's enough to look at in vivo bioactivity. And with the remainder, um, we're, we're able to do then um, uh, with CAP, uh, CAP NMR, um, um, or, or uh, um, microflow NMR methods were able to get the, the structure in the majority of cases. Uh, so some, some natural products are obviously a little bit, uh, a little bit more challenging. And um, uh, one, one area, uh, one the, the first paper where we really did that more systematically was for uh, Rinkosi viscosa, another extract from Tanzania, uh, where the extract had a nice anti-inflammatory activity. So here, a normal tail of a four-day-old larvae, if you cut it off and you do um, a stain for, for myeloperoxase activity, you see a lot of leukocytes migrating to, to the site of injury, and if you treat with, um, treat with the extract, you get a very nice inhibition of that um, leukocyte migration activity. One of the main components is genistein, which is an isoflavone, which has which is very well-known anti-angiogenic and uh, anti-inflammatory properties. We've now have, we, we've pulled out two, uh, two close analogs of this, plus a completely structurally novel uh, molecule, which is, which is related to the isoflavones, but has a completely different um, uh, structure. It's like a fusion of isoflavones and another, and another structure, and we're very excited about that. Uh, I'll just skip over this real quickly and head to uh, the other part of the um, talk, which is focusing on toxicity. So, 
so we have, on the one hand, um, uh, these bioassays, and I just told you about angiogenesis, and Camilla will tell you more about epilepsy, but a lot of what we do also centers around toxicity, so using the zebrafish embryos to look at uh, possible toxicities of early, uh, very early in the drug discovery process. So uh, this is certainly true for <clears throat> modern drug discovery from molecules coming from synth synthetic libraries, but also if you want to be serious about natural products, making it ultimately into the clinic, you have to look at early as possible what kind of toxicities are going on. So this is a project that was, which was funded by the IDWT, IDWT, which is a Flemish research agency. It involves uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals, which is the pharma arm of Johnson & Johnson, um, uh, and, and us, uh, and smaller partners are TNO, which is a, a CRO up in the ne Netherlands, which does a very nice uh, uh, pathology uh, as a service, uh, working together with Leica and a, co a small company in Munich called Definians, which does uh, image analysis. And the goal is to develop a high-throughput um, multi-organ toxicity screening platform in the fish, looking simultaneously at hepatotoxicity, cardiotoxicity, and neurotoxicity, and uh, with a strong focus on, on hepatotoxicity. Well, let me tell you briefly about cardiotoxicity. So there, if you look in the zebrafish, there's a two-chambered heart here. We have a transgenic line, which, uh, which uh, looks exactly like this, so where only the heart lights up. Um, you can look at the beating of the heart, uh, you can look at potential edemas, and you can monitor, uh, very importantly, you can monitor the heart um, and, uh, and basically, together with uh, Definience, we're optimizing a video, automated video image analysis system that looks at the beating of the two chambers and detects um, possible discordances, so not just the rate of the whole heart as such, but the, the rate, the individual rate of the two chambers. Let me just uh, show you how that works. Okay, so hopefully you can see the difference. This is a, a normal wild type fish, and you see uh, uh, the atrium on the bottom and the ventricle on, on, on the top, and uh, a, a beating ratio about one to one. And the, the, the fr overall frequency is a little bit more than 100 beats per minute. Depends a bit on the temperature. And this is uh, Cisapride, which is a, gas a gastrointestinal motility drug, which was ultimately withdrawn from the market because of QT prolongation effects. Uh, so, uh, normally, you were supposed to take that drug to help you go to the bathroom better, but the problem was when you're in the bathroom, you had a higher chance of dying from a heart attack, and that's why they withdraw it from the market. Uh, and so, if you look here, you see the atrium still beating roughly at the same frequency, but the ventricle is only beating at half the frequency. So, this is a very typical effect of a, of a, of a, of a QT prolongation-inducing drug. Um, and very easy to see with the eyes in fish, but also very easy for the video tracking system to see. So this is something that we can, that we, that we can look at. Uh, and so uh, one of the main questions we're trying to answer with Janssen is so can we use it as a, as a high throughput system to look at drug-induced liver injury, so uh, DILI. Uh, so the questions are, do zebrafish have relevant drug metabolism? So when, they, when you give a drug into the fish, are, there, are, there, are all the enzymes there in the fish, the SIPs, et cetera, to convert, uh, to convert those drugs into the metabolites that you would have in a, in a, in, in a human setting? Um, are the, are the uh, toxicity mechanisms the same as in humans? Uh, uh, is it possible to set up a high throughput system? And, and what other toxicities are relevant um, in, in conjunction with uh, hepatotoxicity? So just very basically, if you do a, a whole mountain C2 hybridization in fish, you can see um, with a liver-specific marker, you can see this blue dot here is, is the liver. And if you, uh, and if you um, uh, treat with amiodarone, which was withdrawn from, from the market because of hepatotoxicity reasons, um, then you see so increasing concentrations of amiodarone cause a complete loss of, of, that, of that liver tissue. Um, and that's a very good indication of, uh, of uh, hepatotoxicity. The, uh, the uh, a major part of the project is that we're also looking at the actual um, pathology. So looking at the liver as it as it uh, as it's been uh, the effects on the liver of, of uh, hepatotoxic compounds and comparing them to the pathology um, in the humans. And so, for example, looking at uh, acetaminophen, which is paracetamol. Uh, increasing concentrations of acetaminophen cause uh, all kinds of, uh, basically a loss. The, the, the light blue columns is, is normal liver. And so all, uh, you see a, you see an increase in, in fish where they have a reduced staining intensity of, of, of the liver-specific marker. Uh, 
and also uh, an enlarged liver, and both signs of, of uh, hepatotoxicity, which is a reason why you should not take too much paracetamol, and especially not after drinking alcohol and you wake up the next morning with a headache, never take paracetamol. And uh, basically what we're, uh, what we're doing here is looking at, at um, can, we, can we combine the zebrafish uh, hepatotoxicity assay with, uh, with the high content screen in human hep G2 cells and use the results from both screens to have a better predictivity of hepatotoxicity in the drug discovery process. So uh, the predictivity uh, in the high content screen, I mean, these are just four examples, is about 50%, which is okay, but not, not spectacular. So two uh, well-known hepatotoxic drugs, so tetracycline and paracetamol, are not picked up in the high content screen. However, they are in, uh, in zebrafish. Uh, zebrafish uh, missed one here, but on the other hand, in, in the high content screen, it was picked up. So if you combine both, uh, the, the predictivity reaches uh, much higher. Uh, one could argue here 100%, but in general, it's approaching 80% or so, which is quite good. And uh, another way of looking at it is that uh, a series of hepatotoxic drugs with their clean analogs. So th these are drugs that were with either withdrawn from the market or otherwise flagged for hepatotoxicity, and clean analogs were made. Uh, and in the, in those, in, 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 uh, in the large majority of cases, uh, the clean analogs do not show up as, as hepatotoxic, uh, as hepatotoxic in zebrafish, um, and, and, the, and the dirty analogs do. So uh, again, if you combine both assays, uh, uh, high content screening and zebrafish, you get a very nice high predictivity. Um, and this is just looking at the, at the, at the um, metabolism. So if you inject, in this case, midazolam into the livers of adult fish and you look at the metabolites, the, the range of metabolites is very uh, similar to what you would see in the humans. So we know that the, that the enzymes that are responsible for creating hepatotoxic metabolites uh, are similar between humans and zebrafish. So all these things point to being able to use the fish as a, as a nice assay for hepatotoxicity. Uh, so th uh, this is what we've now developed uh, as part of this project, is basically a transgenic line that has a fluorescent liver um, to be able to look at the size and shape and the, and the intensity of the staining in the liver, and also a fluorescent heart so we can monitor um, the heart. So the idea is to take a three-day-old fish of this double transgenic line, expose it starting at three days to a, to a drug, look one day later uh, for a potential uh, cardiotoxicity, and then look at a total of three days after that, uh, so uh, look at six days post-fertilization, then for, for potential effects on the liver. So we would determine that it takes about three days for hepatotoxic effects to show up. Um, so all the, all the um, assays that I've pointed out to you are, uh, are part of our platform, but what, we're, uh, what, we're, what Camilla will tell you a little bit more about is, is our is CNS uh, platform, which involves a behavioral uh, screening. And uh, we are now coordinator of a, of a large EU grant, which is called Pharmacy, uh, that involves 24 international partners in 14 countries, and we're screening about 20,000 uh, marine uh, extracts, so from marine microorganisms which are collected from cold and deep, deep sea environments, mostly from the North Atlantic, but also off, off the coast of Chile, South Africa, and New Zealand. Um, and uh, there are different bioassays in here, and there's a company focusing on anti-inflammatory, and a group uh, in, down in Spain focusing on anti-infective um, uh, uh, assays, but we're focusing on, uh, we're trying to find neuroactive natural products, in this case from marine uh, microorganisms. And so this will be keeping us busy. We have a few people coming into the lab in the fall because it's starting now. Um, and uh, so it's not just looking for the neuroactivity, but also using the toxicity assays, which we described, not just to screen the neuroactive ones, but also the ones in, that the other partners are finding for anti-inflammatory, anti-infectives. They'll be going through our toxicity assays to make sure that we're not pursuing things that are, uh, that are too toxic. Uh, so this is a recent uh, picture of our group. Um, for some reason, we have all female PhD students. Uh, <laughs> one there, there's one. There's one guy coming from Vietnam now in, in September, uh, and he'll and, and two more. Oh, actually, a total of four, four more women as well. So, uh, <laughs> interesting ratio there. But uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's a it's a good group and uh, very international as well. Philippines, Ecuador, yeah, also from Vietnam now, Russia, Hungary. Uh, no Italians. Uh, so some, maybe we could change something on that front. 
Oh, yeah, two, two Italians in the fall. Yeah, yeah, uh, both visiting students coming in the fall for a master's and a master's, uh, but, so half a year to a year. And so these are, so Camilla will continue now with the, with the CNS, but I just want to mention again the, the collaborators. So for the toxicity work, we're working together with Johnson Johnson, so Janssen in, in Belgium, Moline Billy University in Tanzania, and the, and the advanced uh, natural product work is together with uh, Jean-Luc Wolfender at the University of, of Geneva. And that's what a real zebrafish uh, looks like. And so, yeah.